Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. I'm Amanda Jadro, Portfolio Manager with Tricom. As a financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member in the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider Webinar Series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to the staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenter today is Kit Welchlin. Kit grew up on a hog and dairy farm in southern Minnesota and began public speaking at the age of nine in a 4-H public speaking contest. At age 21, he purchased his first manufacturing company and by age 26 served as CEO and chairman of the board for three manufacturing companies in three states. He has a bachelor's degree in speech communication, business administration, and political science. Received a master's degree in speech communication and business administration. Kit has taught for 23 years for the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities where he has received the Teaching Excellence Award and has been repeatedly nominated as outstanding faculty. He is a professional member of the National Speakers Association. And in 2014, Kit was inducted into the Minnesota Speakers Association Hall of Fame. He has delivered more than 3,000 speeches and seminars to more than 500,000 people over the past 24 years. Today, Kit will be presenting Handling Difficult People. It is estimated that approximately 20% of our population can be classified as difficult, which is why it can be help helpful to learn how to identify and manage your interactions with difficult people. Our guest speaker, Kit Welchon from Welchon Communication Strategies, will teach you how to handle difficult people with professionalism, including the 10 different types of diff difficult people, five action steps to respond rather than react, five strategies in controlling your emotions and responding appropriately, how to differentiate yourself from everyone else, 50 strategies to deal with the truly ruthless. By the end of today's session, you'll know how to handle difficult people without becoming one of them. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature located on the right toolbar or um, the chat feature. At the end of the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. Please join me in welcoming Kit Welton. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for that, that flattering introduction. My goodness, after, after an introduction like that, I, I can't wait to hear what I have to say. I should keep a copy of that so the next time someone says, hey, who do you think you are? That's something I can tell them. Thank you for that nice introduction. And we're going to be spending 45 minutes or so today talking about how to handle difficult people. I don't know anything more exhausting emotionally, psychologically, and physically, and even spiritually than having to deal with difficult people day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Now, for the last 20 years, I've been collecting strategies and techniques and communication concepts that seem to help to manage those relationships and handle difficult people. Over the years, this presentation has been called Dealing with People You Can't Stand, How to Work with Bullies, Tyrants, and Jerks. And we're going to be talking about the main reasons why people become difficult, uh, the top 10 difficult people we'll be having to face, whether it's on the phone or really face-to-face. -face. And then also, we're going to be taking a look at 50 strategies to deal with the truly ruthless. So it's, this is going to be fast-paced. I hope you have pen and paper ready because we're going to go through quite a few strategies, and I have found over the last 20 years these strategies really do work. So let's get to work. Now, the first thing we need to consider uh, really are the words that come to mind when we think of difficult people. Some of those words are arrogant, some are mean-spirited, some are liars, some are uh, people that uh, are always right, and people that don't take responsibility. There's a long list of words that come to mind when we think of difficult people. So we're going to have to, first of all, identify what are those areas in our life that when people attack that, make us mad. And when we consider that, then we can be better prepared for when we run into a difficult person 
so we can minimize the negative impact it has on our on our day. So what are the areas of your life when people attack them and make you mad? Well, for me, in the speaking season throughout the year, my weight will vary about 20 pounds. When I'm really busy, I don't have a chance to exercise, I don't have a chance to eat well, and it's kind of a struggle for me to keep the weight off. Then there's about four months of the summer that I'm not quite as busy as I am the other eight months, and I get a chance to, to get caught back up on my health plan. But my wife's grandmother, God rest her soul, whether I was up 20 pounds or down 20 pounds, whenever she would give me a hug when we met her at her home, she'd always say, oh, it feels like you put on a little weight. You know? And I just wanted to grab her around her skinny little throat and pop her on the top of the head. But I said, thank you, Max. I'm so glad you care about my weight. And, you know, what's kind of interesting is her three daughters and her son, grown adults, would also, every time they got together, talk about their weight or what diet plan they were on or what exercise program or what shake and bake they were doing to try to lose some weight. Because that was the thing that their mother, uh, my wife's grandmother, would always bring up. It was always about weight. So, you know, over time, we get a little sensitive to that. Uh, the other area of my life that when people attack that make me mad is my honesty or trustworthiness. If that's ever questioned, that just feels like my head's going to explode. So we need to figure out and recognize what are those areas in the soft underbelly of our self-esteem that when people attack that makes us mad. And it can be areas in which you are very competent. Maybe you're a great parent and they'll say something about, have you talked to your delinquent kids lately? Uh, maybe you are very competent on the job, and they say, did you fill that out correctly this time? And you filled it out correctly a thousand times. I mean, you'd like to stab them in the throat. You can't do that. So you say, yeah, I think I did. So we have to be able to identify what are those areas in our life that when people attack that make us mad, so we're prepared in advance when they go to work on attacking us in those areas, because they will. So we have four options when we deal with difficult people. One is the status quo. We can sit through the next 40 minutes or so and think, well, that was kind of interesting. I don't think I'm going to do any of that because maybe right now you're gutting it out. Maybe you don't have a pounding headache. Maybe you don't have an upset stomach. Uh, but maybe, you're, you know, what you're doing right now is getting you through the day and through the week. I would like you to consider changing your attitude about difficult people. Sometimes there's a good reason why they become difficult. And if we recognize the four intentions that aren't being fulfilled that cause them to become difficult, we might be able to appreciate something about them. Sometimes if we step back and think about this person, we might also recognize that they even have friends. I, haven't, I, I really don't have any idea why they would, but sometimes they even have friends. But they have a particular skill that we can admire, or maybe they volunteer and we can appreciate that. But sometimes if we change our attitude, it will change the way we communicate with them. The third uh, option is to change our behavior. That's it change the way we communicate. So we respond rather than react. So we're going to have a wide variety of ways to say things differently, to respond differently, and then they'll be intrigued by us rather than wanting to insult us. They'll respect us rather than want to resent us. Or the last option is you can leave because they're probably not going to. This is the type of person that has that standing threat. If they're ever fired, they'll sue everybody in the organization. I always tell my clients when they have someone like that to fire them. And if they don't have the courage, I'll fire them. I carry a $4 million liability policy. Let's use it. Uh, but this is a person that is driving talent away. You could hire two people half as qualified as they are and be money ahead because of the talent you're leaving because of them. So if they're not going to leave, eh, you know what? You might have to leave. And then you'll recognize later after a couple of weeks that, you know, I didn't really enjoy the job that much anyway. But that's always an option. So let's go ahead and explore why do people become difficult? Well, there's four intentions that need to be fulfilled that everyone has when they come to work. One is to get it done, whatever it is. So if someone you work with on a project wants to get it done, if you like this person, of course, you focus on the task getting it done. And your communication with them is, would be brief and to the point. Problem is we don't necessarily like everybody we work with. And then when you work with somebody that wants to get it right, if you like this person, of course, you focus on the task. Great, you know, pay great attention to details. All your reports well documented, all your I's dotted, all your T's crossed. Problem is we, we don't necessarily like all the people we work with. And it's not that we're going to do it wrong, but they kind of have a sense that we're not going to do our best work for them. And then when you work with somebody who wants to get along with you, and if you like that person, of course, you get engage in friendly chit-chat and consider it communications. Problem is we don't necessarily like everybody that we work with, so we might avoid them or create some distance or 
try not to be guilty by association. And then when there's somebody that wants to get appreciation and they're not getting any, well, then they might uh, exaggerate their behavior to at least get some attention. But if it's somebody that wants to get appreciation and we like this person, of course, we'd recognize their contributions with words of gratitude and, and do that enthusiastically. Problem is we don't necessarily like all the people we work with. So what happens when these intentions aren't fulfilled? Well, if somebody wants to get it done, and if it's not going to get done, they become more controlling, more demanding, and more forceful. And then when people want to get it done right, and they fear it's going to be done wrong, now they become perfectionistic, pointing out potential flaws, potential errors. Are you sure you filled that out correctly? And of course you did. Uh, when people want to get along with you and they feel left out, then they're going to exaggerate their behavior and become more approval-seeking, trying to win the relationship by doing special favors. Oh, I'll drop that off at UPS on my way home. You know, I'm going out to the warehouse. I'll take that out for you. And what happens is when they're trying to win the relationship, they don't get their work done. And it's almost like they're kind of socially stalking you at work. And we really want to get some commitments from them that we can count on that are job-related, not relational. And then when people want to get appreciation and they're not getting any, they'll throw an adult temper tantrum or they'll go quiet for a couple of days. And then everyone will crowd around them. You haven't said anything for a couple of days. Are you okay? Are you all right? And they'll uh, um, at least get the attention if they're not getting the appreciation. And they go into this metamorphosis and they turn into people we can't stand. But let's take a look at this for a second. Let's say I made my living as an accountant. And I'm working late on a Friday afternoon with my accounting partner. And we're working on a future financial statement, a performance statement. It's just kind of an estimate of future performance for the organization. And my accounting partner says, you know, this number here, let's just round that off to $30,000. That's close enough. I said, no, 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 this is an important client. This is, a, is an important financial document. I'm going to take it home this weekend and work on it. I want to get it right. And my partner said, well, go ahead, knock yourself out. I say, I will. So I take the document home to work on it over the weekend. Well, Saturday morning, I'm going through the house. My wife's in the house. The kids are in the house. They say, Daddy, Daddy, come out and play. My wife says, Honey, come out and play. And, of course, I want to get along with my family, so I go out to play. I come back in the house. I'm still in the get-along mode. My wife says, Hey, kid, would you be willing to fix that leaky faucet in the kitchen? You said you might get a chance to work on that. I'm still in the get-along mode, so I say, Sure. So my wife leaves to run some personal errands and take the faucet apart. I find there's a little rubber gasket that's cracked and corroded and needs to be replaced. As I open up the cabinet to get some paper towels to clean up the mess, I notice the cabinet door is scuffed up and the hinge is cracked about ready to snap off. So when I go to the hardware store, I get some paint, I get a new hinge, I paint the cabinet, put a new hinge on, and I just get done finishing the faucet when my wife walks in, and I say, honey, check out the faucet. She turns it on and shuts it off. Jesus says, wow, it works great. And I said, I know, thanks. Take a look at that cabinet door. Cabinet door, yeah, I painted it, put a new hinge on there. She steps back, takes a look and says, wow, it looks great. And off I go, got my appreciation. Next thing I realize, it's 1030 Sunday night, and I'm just shutting off the TV from watching the news. And I remember, I haven't worked on that financial statement. So I go down to my office, I open up the books. Five minutes later, I say, ah. 30000 is close enough. I just want to get it done. And in one weekend, I can go from wanting to get it right, get along, get appreciation, or just get it done. And if anybody stood in the way of those intentions being fulfilled, I stand the chance of becoming difficult. Sometimes I think about changing the title of this presentation to you, me, and other difficult people. But I don't think anybody would ever hire me for that. So let's take a look at our top 10 list, the top 10 most common difficult people we will run into. There's a great little book called Dealing with People You Can't Stand, Bringing Out the Best of People When They're at Their Worst, with, written by Dr. Rick Brinkman and Dr. Rick Kirshner. And they give us some guidelines of how to respond to people who want to get it done, get it right, get it along, get appreciation. And I found these strategies really do work well. So if you're dealing with someone that's called the tank, they want to get it done, and they think you're part of the reason for it not getting done, your goal is to command respect. Tanks simply don't attack people they respect. Now, the way you do that is you need to hold your ground. Don't change your position verbally or non-verbally. Whatever you said, how you said it, what you looked like when you said it, you should respond just like you're recorded and replayed. You need to interrupt their attack by saying their name, saying, Corey, 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 and they'll say, what? And you say, I want to get it done, too. And you aim for the bottom line so they know that you've heard them. And then you talk in I language, the way I'm going to approach this, what I'm going to do, how I'm handling it, and they'll interrupt you again, and you say, Corey, Corey, what? 
That's the second time you interrupt with me. I welcome your feedback when I'm through and you finish the conversation. Now, if you were wrong, admit your mistake and state briefly what you do differently and what you've learned from your experience to make sure it doesn't happen to anybody else going forward. But that tank will respect you. Uh, everyone else is still an idiot, but they'll respect you. But if you said to a tank, some of us were talking or maybe we could do this, if you say some of us were talking, they'll say, ooh, maybe. There's no such thing as maybe to a tank. You either do or you don't. So if you have some tanks in your life, jot down their name, make sure you hold your ground, interrupt their attack by saying their name, say, I want to get this done too, and the way I'm going to handle it, the way I'm going to approach it, and I welcome your feedback when I'm through, and they'll respect you. Let's take a look at the next one, and yeah, that would be the know-it-all. You know what the problem is with know-it-alls? They really do. They want to get it done. They know how to get it done. They've been getting it done for years. You think, don't they have a life? This is their life. It's what they breathe, eat, sleep. Uh, know-it-alls are knowledgeable people. They're extremely competent people. They're highly assertive and outspoken in their viewpoints. So what we need to do is be prepared and know our stuff, not to impress them with our knowledge because they'll bury us. Instead, we need to be prepared to know our stuff so we can ask some intelligent questions and blend with their doubts or concerns. So you backtrack respectfully, saying, are you concerned that we may run out of money? Are you concerned that we may run out of time? And then you have to present your ideas indirectly. Perhaps we could do this. Maybe we could do this. What would you think of this? And you invite them into the decision because they know how to get it done, and we want to be a partner in the conversation. Probably the toughest part of working with know-it-alls is the fifth step, and that is to turn them into your mentors, to openly acknowledge them as your mentor. Now, it almost makes you want to throw up because you have to swallow a lot of pride, and it doesn't all stay down. But this is the way I do it. As soon as I realize that I'm working with uh, know-it-all, I just kind of stop, look dumbfounded, and I say, you know what? You seem to know more about this than anybody else I've worked with. Well, they love that because you know what? It's true. Now you've just been given a gift. You have a reference library that came in the form of a human being, and you can walk into their office the next day and say, I'm thinking about bringing this up at the, at the, uh, at the meeting next Tuesday. What do you think I should mention? They'll come back 20 minutes later with a 50-page document highlighted with little flags with the order and sequence. They'll present the ideas. They'll come back the next morning and say, hey, take a look at this. They can do your research in minutes where it might take you days or weeks or months to find it, but they are know-it-alls. So when you deal with a know-it-all, know your stuff, do a little reading so you can ask some questions, blend with their doubts or concerns, express your uh, ideas indirectly, perhaps maybe, but what you think and then acknowledge their good intent and their great knowledge base. They'll love you. Let's take a look at the next one. That would be the sniper. Now, the sniper has two intentions. One is to get it done, and the other is to get appreciation. Get it done, the way they do that is they believe they control you through embarrassment and humiliation. I call these drive-by insults. They'll say things like, oh, nice tie. You know, must have been a gift. Or they'll say, nice sweater. How many sofas did you sold us you know, to, to make that, you know? But the, they, they always seem to uh, have a cutting remark, and the reason they're doing that is because then they believe they can control you through that humiliation and embarrassment. Uh, it could also be they want to get appreciation. I came to the meeting, did you notice me? And we really don't appreciate their sense of humor, so at least they're going to exaggerate their behavior and get some attention by saying something that is outrageous. So what we need to do with a sniper, and I don't care what their intention is, whether it's to get it done or get appreciation, we need to bring them out of hiding. So you stop the conversation, you look at everybody else in the room, you turn to them and say, I'm sorry, what did you say about my tie? I'm sorry, what did you say about my sweater? And you repeat their insult or ask them to repeat their insult. And usually they don't. They'll say, oh, you just, you know, I'm just kidding. Or, oh, don't you have a sense of humor? And you say, well, what I, uh, well, I was just kind of wondering what this has to do with this or I'm wondering, you know, what, why you brought that up. So you keep the conversation going. You know, what do you mean by that, or what does that have to do with this? Because they don't believe you have the guts or gall to respond to their under-the-breath comments. If this doesn't seem to help, then you might have to go with the tank strategy. Uh, you just command respect. You hold your ground. You backtrack. I want to get this done. At the time, I want to approach it. I welcome your feedback when I'm through. And then you say something like, I assume we'll get along on this project. And you just kind of take control of the conversation. Now, if you've heard they've been spreading rumors about you or talking behind your back or running the rumor mill, they have to go on a grievance patrol. You have to track them down and confront and clear the air, saying, I've heard you said this about me. Is it true? Now, most people won't do that, and you're different than everybody else, so they're probably going to leave you alone, and they'll go pick on somebody else. You're not going to change this person. You're just going to change the way they treat you. 
and then we have to be comfortable with that. I, you know, to change this person, sometimes it's a, a bolt of lightning. It's, a, it's an act of God. It's a, a disease that almost kills them, and it might change the way they see the world, but probably not. And uh, one of the things you need to do is suggest a civil future. If you ever have a problem in my relationship, I'd love to talk to you one-on-one. I expect we'll get along. And uh, they will leave you alone. They'll just go pick on somebody else. So bring them out of hiding. Ask them to repeat their insult. Say, what does that have to do with this? If they are going behind your back, track them down, talk about it. Use a tank strategy if you need to. But you can manage those snipers. The next on the list is the think they know it all. They really don't. They read something some time ago about something like this. I know it alls want to get appreciation, but it's hard to appreciate how shallow their ideas are. There's not a lot of depth, and there's not a lot backing up their opinions. But you do want to give their bad ideas the hook. You kind of remember the Gong Show where they had the unknown comic with the paper bag over his head. That's kind of the way you have to approach this conversation with a think they know it all. You kind of you know hit the Gong and kind of shove them off the stage. But you need to give them a little attention because they might have something of value to add to the conversation. So you might say, uh, backtrack with their comments and ask, so what was it that you read or where did you find that article or when did you read that and ask for some specifics. And they'll say, well, I don't know when I, where, where that was or who it was, or but I remember reading something about something like this. And they say, well, what I've read, what I've heard, so you kind of tell it like it is and you move on. Uh, you can use something called Junkologic where you say, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. That reminds me of what we were talking about. So it gives them some appreciation that fulfills that need for attention. And if that doesn't occur, but you might have to have a conversation with them outside the meeting, talk about the consequences of the negative behavior, and then tell them what they need to do, make a copy of that article, track it down, bring it in, we'll talk about it in the meeting. So then you can give them some guidance on the behavior that you really can give them credit for where credit is due. But the think they know it alls are really starving for appreciation, so you need to engage in the conversation, see if there's something they have of value, where did you read that, when did you read that, who was the author. What did it say? And they say, what I've read, what I've heard, and then say, I'm glad you brought that up. That reminds me of what we were talking about. And uh, you will be able to manage that relationship, too. Now, let's take a look at the grenade. Now, the grenade is somebody that wants to get appreciation. Uh, the grenade is a person whose efforts to get appreciation were thwarted by others' indifference. Their behavior now becomes this inescapable or immediate demand for attention blowing up or losing emotional control. That's kind of their defense strategy when they don't feel appreciated. Now, our goal with them is to take control of the situation. So get their attention, call their name, raise your voice, wave your arms in a friendly way, and aim for the heart. And say, I know you're frustrated. I know you're disappointed. I can see that you're angry. And then you reduce the intensity, lower the pitch of your voice, soften the tone of your voice, lower the volume of your voice, and then say, you know what, I'll be right back. And then go back to your office, wait about five minutes, come back. That gives them time for the little uh, bright stars to go away and, and uh, they know to wipe the spit off their chest or to pick up whatever they knocked down when they had the emotional outburst. Uh, but uh, take a time out and come back and say, you know, I was kind of wondering how did that project go or when I was gone for the last couple of days, how did things go with any emails or any sort of uh, responses that I need to take care of or phone calls I need to return. Uh, the key to the grenade is to recognize what it is that sets them off. Uh, find the pin. What is it that they're starving to be appreciated for? And then make sure you just provide that right away to prevent the opportunity for them to explode. Now, my oldest brother is a police officer, and he'll call me sometimes when he's working, and then when I'm done with a speech or seminar, I'll call him back. And his response will always be, hey, I'll quit calling me at work. I'm responsible for every minute of every hour, 10 hours a day. I'll call you back after work. And, and, and I was just like, hi, ah, you know what, I'm calling you back. You're the one that called me, you know. And, uh, and I realized, you know, he was a grenade. He's starving for appreciation. So now what I do when I call him back, I say, hey, how's the hardest working man in law enforcement? And then his response is, <laughs> I don't know if I'm the hardest working man in law enforcement, but, but I'm crunching crime. <laughs> a completely different tone to that conversation. When my wife was a stay-at-home mom and I would stop by my office and I would be working uh, I would, uh, she'd say, you didn't notice. And I said, what? You didn't notice. And I'd go upstairs a lot in the living room. And I'd look in the living room. I said, did you move that chair? You know, the good news is she moved furniture a lot. And she goes, no, you know, I put a plant over there on that corner. Oh, yeah, it looks beautiful. So I realized she was starving for attention and, at least, uh, you know, needed and really should be appreciated. So I came, uh, anytime I stopped by my office during the day in our home office, 
I'd uh, drive in the driveway. I'd take a look in the front yard to see if there was anything that had changed, picked up the toys, moved the lawn. I'd walk in the front door saying, wow, it smells good in here. Did you clean the bathroom? Oh, this is the master bathroom. And it smells great. And it was delightful to be around there. So when we have people that are starving for appreciation, make sure you appreciate the things that they do. And if you forgot to and they blow up like a grenade, you're going to have to wave them down, talk them down, empathize with them, tell me of all the people in the organization, you're the one I thought of that would handle this for me, do such a great job. And then get away from them, come back and start the conversation all over again. And you'll be all right working with the grenades. Let's take a look at the yespers. Now, this is somebody who wants to get along with everybody. Uh, their desire to get along with everyone, to please everyone, to be helpful, to become overwhelmed with all of these personal tasks that they become involved with. So what you want to do is get some commitments from them that you can count on. Now, the way we do that is you have to sit down and talk to them like friends. Now, I'd like to wring their neck, but I'm asking you to sit down and talk to them like friends. Now, it's usually about this point in the presentation where people say, wow, Kit, this seems kind of manipulative. Yeah, it is. So what? <laughs> but the reason I feel that way is let's say you're in a station in life right now where you're dating. And you have a date coming up Friday night, and that person you date uh, is going, uh, goes and uh, washes the car, get, goes to the salon and uh, does something with their hair, and they buy some new clothes. They pull up to your house on Friday night, and they get out of their clean car, and they say, how do I look? And what they did to their hair, you wouldn't have done that. And the clothes that they bought, you would have purchased something else. And you, but you would say, because you love them, you look great. So we feel comfortable lying to the people we love, but then uncomfortable acting like friends with people we work with. I do not understand the ethical dilemma here. So anyway, with a yes person, sit down and talk to them like friends. Uh, Two-way communication and talk honestly, listen and clarify, acknowledge them for their honesty, and then uh, clarify what seemed to be the problem and use the past as a case study. If we could go back in time, what could we do differently to make sure we don't miss our deadline? A lot of we, us, and our in that comment. That sounds like a relationship. And they say, well, I don't know, because they don't want to tell you in case you don't like the idea, then they think you don't like them. So then you say, how about if I email you a week before the deadline? Will that help? Yep, yep, yep. I'll write that down. I'll, I'll email you a week before. How about if I give you a phone call two days before the deadline? Will that help? Yeah, that would help. Okay, write that down. I'll call. Okay, they, do, they will because they want to get along with you. And then how about that morning? I'll stop by and have a brief conversation to make sure we're still on schedule. Will that help? That would help. Okay, write that down. I'll do that too. So and then you review it. I'll email you a week before. I'll call you two days before, and I'll stop by that morning. And if I do that, we will finish this project on time and get their word of honor, get the commitment. And if they say, yep, okay, great. Now, they probably won't follow through. So when they don't follow through, you have to describe what happened or what they did, tell them how other people were affected, tell them how you feel about it, and then say to them, that's not like you. I think it was Mark Twain that said, sometimes you have to lie to tell the truth. Now, in a great book called Communicating Today, written by Dr. Raymond Zuster, he claims it takes 27 consecutive repetitions of a new communication behavior to form a new communication pattern. So you might have to be saying to them 27 times, you know, that's not like you. You know, that's not like you. You finish your, my projects on time. And after a short period of time, it will be the truth because they will follow through and they will get it done. And then when they do it right, tell them what they did right. Tell them how others were affected positively. Tell them how you feel about that. And Tell them you're looking forward to more of the same, and it will be true over time. So those yes people, uh, they just have, uh, they're kind-hearted. They want to have relationships. Uh, sit down with them, talk about the problem, use it as a case study, come up with some strategies, ask for their word of commitment, and then uh, let them know when they let you down and let them know when they do a great job, and they'll rather do the great job. Let's take a look at the maybe person. I think when I was young, I was probably a tank, but, you know, I had more scar tissue and arthritis, and the more I read, the more I realize I don't know. So I've become kind of a maybe person. Uh, maybe people have a hard time making a decision. They look at the downside of every option that kind of blinds them. They have numerous reasons for not seeking help, for not wanting to bother anyone or not wanting to upset anyone or not wanting to be the cause of anything going wrong. What we need to do is help them think decisively. See, we need to give them a simple decision-making model. So sit down and talk to them like friends, just like we did with the yes person, and then surface those conflicts and clarify options and explore those options and obstacles, and then give them a decision-making system that's really simple, like pros and cons, pluses and minuses, and then tell them that you respect and appreciate people that are honest with you and make decisions, so you reassure and then ensure follow-through by giving them that decision-making system to follow to reach a conclusion to make a decision. I promote the idea of a better future for the both of you as a result of their honesty with you. 
So just give them that simple decision-making model like a T-graph. Uh, let them know that you're always available if they'd like to talk about what could go wrong and what they need to consider and what they need to keep in mind. And then tell them, you know, make the decision. I'll always respect people that make decisions. And then tell them it's better for your relationship because of their honesty and their decisiveness. And they'll be all right. You can work with maybe people. Now, the next one is the nothing person. Uh, the nothing person has a, is in a double bind. They want to get it right and they want to get along. So a nothing person is someone you wait to hear from. Uh, they don't want to give you any bad news. So you might not get any verbal feedback. If you ask some questions, you might not get any nonverbal feedback. It's almost like their mouth is sealed shut and the nothing person stares past you as if they're not even there, almost in a stare. What we need to do is get them to talk uh, because they're a little bit perfectionistic and they also are seeking approval. And they don't want to be wrong because then you might not like them. And if they're wrong, of course, that isn't right. So what we need to do as the nothing person is sit down with them and plan enough time. Ask open-ended questions, what or how questions, because typically there's no wrong answer to what or how questions. The key is to make sure when you ask those open-ended questions, you wait silently for them to respond. Now, this is called wait time. It's about 45 seconds before people really start to feel the pressure of silence. So ask a what question, how question, and then go silent until they respond. Now, if they don't respond, then you're going to have to lighten it up a little bit, make absurd, exaggerated, or impossible statements. And so if they come in and say, so... Um, uh, this has been happening every once in a while. He said, well, how, how often? No, they'll just shrug. So to lighten up, you say, so does it happen every five minutes? So every, every day? No, it doesn't happen every five minutes. So once a year or so? No, more often than that. So as long as it isn't every five minutes and it's, you know, less than one year, now everything seems reasonable and there isn't much risk, but you're not done yet. So you have to ask, does it happen every day? No, not that often. Uh, once every six months? No, more often than that. So what do you think, once a week or so? Now they're trying to remember, was it this week or last week? And they say, no, not that often. So once a month or so? And this is what they're thinking now. Well, there's 28 days in February. There's 31 days of March. But if we go with four week weeks, four work weeks, that would be 20 days. I mean, that's how bound up tight they are. So you really have to lighten it up. Guess the reason for their silence? Are you concerned I may be upset? Are you concerned it might damage our relationship? Are you concerned, you know, no news? It's good news? I mean, help me understand. And then uh, share with them the negative consequences. If they don't provide the information, you're not going to get things right. And, you know, you might not get along. So sometimes you have to level with them and aim for the bottom line. Now, the next type of difficult person you'll deal with is the no person. The no person is task-focused. Uh, they're motivated by the intent to get it right by avoiding mistakes. They see themselves as the only person in the organization willing and able to look at what will go wrong and point it out. They find negatives in everything and everyone. So what we're going to do is we're going to move them from fault finding to problem solving. Go with the flow. Let them be as negative as they'd like to be. Use them as a resource. Say, I'd like to bring this up next week. What do you think could go wrong? Have pen and paper ready because they'll give you a, a long list of things. You know, They're not going to like it. They're not going to support it. There's no money in the budget for that. We don't have the resources. Write them all down so you have time over the next week to think about how you're going to respond to that. They'll come back the next day and say, could I already sleep last night? There's something else that could go wrong. Uh, but it does give you time to get prepared for the conversation later. So when you get to the meeting and you bring it up, if this is something I'd like us to do, and they'll be shaking their head no, and I know this could be a problem, and they nod their head yes because they told you that would be the problem. You get a no person to nod their head yes with you, that's a huge shift in the relationship. And I know this could be a problem. They nod their head yes because they told you just a few days ago it would be a problem. And this could be a problem too. And they nod their head yes with you. And then you say, I think they could overcome these two problems by doing this. And they'll almost shake their head like a dog learning a new trick. And they'll blurt out, I don't care what you say, it's not going to work. Then you go with the polarity response. Yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe it won't work. And then you go silent for about 45 seconds. Everybody in the room is looking at them, looking at you going silent, looking at them, looking at you going silent. And then they might break and say, well, there's, there's something we could do. We're not going to do that. But we could try it in this one department. We could try it with this one client. We could try it with this one particular case. But one of the keys of step five is when you leave the meeting, acknowledge their good intent. Tell them how much you appreciate the, their critical thinking skills and their ability to recognize uh, things that could go wrong. And then you get away from them. And they'll just kind of shake their head because no one's ever complimented them on their critical thinking skills. Tell them how helpful it is and their high standards, how we always make better decisions when they're involved. You say that a half a dozen times after every meeting. I'll tell you what, in a couple of weeks, you'll be sharing an idea in the meeting. And, hey, hey, let's give her some time. Let's hear what he has to say. 
I mean, they, they will be much more supportive. So the no person, let them be as negative as they'd like to be. Use them as a resource. Give them time to think about all the things that could go wrong. Blend with those doubts and concerns. Offer some suggestions of how it could be improved. And then, of course, always compliment them on their critical thinking skills, their details, and uh, attention to high standards. And they'll, they'll work with you. Next one on that list will be the whiner. Now, when it comes to the whiner, they want to get it done right, too. But they kind of get bogged down and worry and well. They want to get it right, so we need to help them by moving them from a problem to a form of problem-solving alliance. So listen to them complain with pen and paper and then ask, so what do you want to do? What? Well, how do you want to handle this? I don't know. Well, how often does it happen? Well, I'm not sure. Say, would you take a couple of weeks and uh, keep a log so we know how often this happens? Let's get together again. That would be on the, that'd be on the 26th. And they'll go out all excited because now they're going to keep a log and recognize how often it happens. And they're not going to talk to anybody else because they don't want to contaminate the study. They might come back in two weeks and say, well, it hasn't happened again. And say, oh, good, problem solved itself. Or they might come back in a couple of weeks and they have a half a dozen ideas. Or it's happened a half a dozen times. And you say, so what do you want to do? Huh? How do you want to solve this problem? Well, I don't know. Well, would you take a couple of weeks and come up with a half a dozen ideas of how to solve this problem? Now, they're not quite as excited when they leave this time because you've just moved them from finger pointing to problem solving. And they might come back in a couple of weeks and say, well, I couldn't really come up with any solutions to the problem. And so then you'd say something like, since your complaints seem to have no solutions, talking about them really isn't accomplishing anything for either one of us. If you happen to think of some possible solutions or change your mind about any of these problems, please let me know. Now, the next time they come back to your office and they start complaining, get out pen and paper and say, how often does this happen? I don't know. Would you take a couple of weeks and keep a log? They'll go whine to somebody else. Hey, that's what we want. So let's take a look at the last group of strategies. These strategies are for dealing with the ruthless, uh, the one to percent of the population that is considered impossible. So these are strategies I'd only like you to use in the most difficult people that you've ever run into. Uh, the first one is to move closer. You change the distance. You change the communication dynamics. Unless you think they're going to punch you or stab you, uh, but move closer. If you've always sat at the far end of the table, see if you can move over a chair or two over the next week or two. In conversations, as you're talking with them, take a half a step closer to them. They'll take a half a step back. Something's different about you, but they don't recognize what it is. But it changes the dynamic. Repeat to yourself, this is a game. Now, don't say that outside, out, out loud. I mean, just say it inside your head, you know, repeat, this is a game. Now, the game is intimidation, and, or, and so what you want to do is, uh, since it is a game, I decide whether or not we're going to play so what I'd like you to do is picture them in your mind as a metaphor. Now, the metaphor I'd like to use is a kangaroo. I get the biggest kick out of kangaroos. I have a great big feet and a great big tail, a little bitty arms, a great big snout. And uh, I work with about 25,000 people a year. 1% of the population is ruthless. So I get about 250 of these a year that come hopping to the front of the room to tell me what a waste of time it was, how, how I can't believe your wife is still married to you, and I, said, I can't believe it either. And what I do is I kind of get the giggles and I don't take it seriously. I laugh. And I said, well, I know, I, you know, you paid me half the fee in advance to guarantee the date. You know, I was kind of surprised when they called. And, you know, I'm surprised she's been hanging around, too. And I just kind of blend with the insult, and I kind of get the giggles. Now, if you don't feel comfortable laughing with them uh, when they're not with you and they can't even see you or hear you, let out a big old belly laugh. According to Dr. Dale Anderson, we get the same benefit of a fake laugh as we do a real, genuine laugh. It releases endorphins. It puts that episode in the past, in the past where it belongs. And you don't drag that negative energy into the other relationships that are innocent. When you're in a conversation with a ruthless, difficult person, I say something that doesn't mean anything. I do a lot of, ooh, ah, oh, hmm, ah, ah. If I'm on the phone, you can go through the vowels. Ah, A, E, O, ooh, and they don't even notice. But make sure you have some non-words that are neutral and that they know that you're responding, but you're not giving them any material to work with. Don't say anything at all. Let them figure out whether you agree, disagree, or don't understand. Repeat, that's an idea. Oh, that's interesting. You've got a point. What does that mean when you say that's an idea? Well, they had an idea. It doesn't mean you agree. That's interesting. It is, because you would never say that. You've got a point, and you're thinking on the top of their head. But these are neutral statements that don't get you trapped in that conversation. And if they try to push you off into a topic you're not prepared to talk about, use step number eight. Say, I'll need some time to think about that. Oh, come on, you've been doing this for years. Nah, I'll need some time to think about that. What, did you swallow an idiot pill this morning? Nah, I'll need some time to think about it. And if you say, I'll need some time to think about that, about three times, on the, they'll say, well, how much time do you need? You say, how about 10 o'clock tomorrow morning? Fine. And then you get a chance to collect your thoughts. But what they're trying to do is push you off into a topic you're not prepared to talk about. Then they can point out how 
incompetent you are, and so we don't want them to have that advantage. Number nine is cover your agenda. If you're going to be providing a progress report to a difficult person, uh, jot down on the left side of your page the points you're going to make, the agenda you're going to follow, and on the right side of the page, their comments, because they're always going to have one. So when you find them, you tap on their door, you say, I'd like to talk to you, give you a progress report. They go, you know, now, you know, it's never a good time. How long is it going to take? Just a minute. Oh, fine. Well, the first thing I'd like to tell you is we've done blah, 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 and they'll respond. Oh, if I'd have been involved, what I would have done is blah, 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 blah. And you say, oh, that's an idea. Uh, the second thing we've done is blah, 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 blah. And they go, oh, you people, I don't know who hired you. If I'd have been involved, what I would have done is blah, 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 blah. Oh, that's interesting. And you write it down. And the third thing we've done is blah, 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 blah. And then they'll shake their head and say, what planet are you from? If I'd have been included, what I would have done is blah, 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 blah. And you say, oh, you've got a point. And then on your way back to your office, you draw a big X through their comments. Because that's crazy making. Never forget what the ruthless, difficult people. Even if you said exactly what they would have said, it's because you said it, it was wrong. Even if you did exactly what they would have done, it's because you did it, it was wrong. I'm kind of surprised we're surprised by it. I don't know why we think we're going to walk in there one day and say, this is what we've done. They're going to say, that's great. Uh, this is the other thing we've done. Well, I get to work with such talented people. Are you kidding me? They'll never say that. So what we need to do is cover our agenda, draw a line through the crazy making on our way back to the office, and we have to redefine winning. You're not going to build a long-lasting, loving relationship with this person anyway. What we're going to try to do is minimize our headaches and stomach aches and quit bringing them up to other people that don't even know them. So redefining winning is picking out a handful of these strategies that really seem to take the pressure off or to minimize the damage and put them into practice so you feel better throughout the day. And number 11 is make being a good listener a priority. Listening is free, and we have to look like we're listening so they believe we are, and that's what we call stable nonverbal communication. So when you sit down, squarely face them. Not square off with them, but turn your upper body toward them. Tip your head when you're following along because you most likely don't agree and you don't want to not. Uh, attentive facial expression. Smile when there's something they say you agree with. Look confused when you are. And when they say something you disagree with, you might want to squint. You don't necessarily want to give them the stink eye, but you do want to let them know that you're probably not going to support that. Uh, remove the barriers between you and the other person. Maybe this is something we should talk about over lunch. Maybe this is something we should never talk about over lunch, but consider the barriers and remove them. Uh, lean forward slightly, show your enthusiasm as a listener, and, of course, make eye contact. People know you hear with your ears. They judge whether or not you're listening with your eyes. Are you making eye contact or not? So get into that stable nonverbal communication posture, and it will certainly look like you're listening. Focus your attention. This might be the most important five or ten minutes of your day. And visualize this ruthless, difficult person as someone that needs your help. See if you can go back to those four intentions. This is someone that needs to get something done or to get it done right, or they're starving to get along with someone, and you're the only person that will still talk to them. Or maybe they want to get appreciation. Maybe we can provide that. Keep an open mind. Uh, they might tell you something you need to hear that nobody else had the courage to tell you. But talk to someone you know and trust to find out if it's true because it's nothing for these people to lie. But they might give you some feedback that's quite honest that you could use that other people didn't know how they'd bring up. They might say, well, you got some really bad breath or cooking next time. Or, well, you got a booger in your nostril, you know. And wouldn't you like to know that, that they're not very kind about how they say it? But double check to somebody you know and trust if you have bad breath or they have a book in your nose every once in a while. And a good friend will say, who said that? And it doesn't matter, but do I have bad breath? Yeah, sometimes you do. Well, can you signal me? Give me a breath saver? Is there one way? Or somehow we can make sure that doesn't happen any longer. But keep in mind, you got to check with somebody whether or not it's true. Uh, number 16 is do not interrupt. Uh, don't run out of things to say. And just listen. Uh, listen to the content, not necessarily how it's delivered. Locker room language does not make them uncomfortable, so you might have to act like it doesn't bother you that much either. I use listening noises, especially on the phone, like I see, I understand, go on. If they say on the phone, are you still there? Then we're not doing our job. What does it mean when we say I see? It just means I have eyes, I can see. I understand, it doesn't mean I agree. Go on. Everyone else wishes they'd shut up. Number 19 is to take notes. The reason I take notes is it slows down the rate and speed in which they insult me. I let them know I'm writing this down so I can pass it along to my people just the way you tell me. Then they start to remove the profanity and exaggerations because you have the information, and now you can provide feedback and verify that you do have it just the way they told you. Uh, don't interrupt. Let them vent. If they're emotionally charged, let them throw a fit, and then you just use their name. Oh, Dave, I'm so glad you brought that to my attention. Or, you know, Karen, I can understand how frustrating this could be, and you empathize with them. Nobody else will, so you need to. 
identify the emotion or the frustration, the anger, the anxiety, whatever they're feeling. Now they'll feel normal, then they'll listen to logic. Logic will not change any emotion. Only empathy will. You've got to blend with the emotion so they feel normal. Then you can move on the conversation with the what or how questions. What do you think we could do? How would you like to approach this? What would you recommend? How have you handled this in the past to clarify and solve the situation? And you also have to be positive. You have to have this positive attitude going into the conversation. Remember the benefits. Well, your salary, maybe a 401K, maybe some health care. But what I, the benefits I'm talking about are respect of your coworker, the reputation of someone that can take on the difficult people, and, uh, you know, referrals from others, too, because you are a true professional. Uh, number 26 is to say, what do you mean or how do you mean? Because we have no idea what they mean. Uh, they don't think like we think. You know, most people try to figure out how to make relationships better. They try to figure out how to get you before you get them. It's a completely different orientation to, the, to relationship. Uh, conf- uh, confirm your agreements in your own words. Uh, this is the type of person that says, you know, order some of those. And they won't give you an exact or specific number until you order five. They go, why do you order so many? Or if you order three, why did you order more? And then you can't win. So you always say, would you like me to order five? Or how many exactly would you like me to order? But make sure you always confirm your agreements in your own words when they use relative language to make sure that you don't do something they can criticize you later for. Uh, number 28 is you, I will, rather than I'll try. I'll try to lie. Either do you don't. So I will call back at 10 o'clock. I will come back at 3 o'clock. I will make sure it's on the agenda on Tuesday. I will remind you. But you got to have that kind of a commitment and sounds determined like you're determined to follow through. You can also use you can statements to say no. They stop by and they need three and you only have two. You can say you can have these two. I will order uh, one more and you can pick that up. Well, I focus on what you can do, not what you can't do. I, uh, they stop by your office, I need this by 3 o'clock. You can pick that up at 4 o'clock, always focus on what you can. If you say, I can't get it done by 3, they'll say, what are you, incompetent? Can't you prioritize your work? But always focus on what you can do. We do this with the kids. We say, we're going to go visit grandpa and grandma. You can go out the front door. You can go out the back door. Hmm, sounds cooperative. But always focus on what you can do. Use will you statements or requests to gain cooperation rather than can you. Can you is a question of competence. Will you is a question of cooperativeness. They would have to say, I won't. Well, that even sounds uncooperative to difficult people. Uh, number 31 is set realistic goals. Some of these strategies will work. Some of these fit your personality and temperament. Some of them don't. But I'll tell you this, I've used them all, and they all work. So realistic goals, yeah, you know what? It's not going to be this real close relationship, but it might be more professional. It might still be uh, somewhat uncomfortable, but it's going to be more civil. But, you know, I think it's important that we keep track of how many headaches we've had and how few we have after we start doing some of these strategies or how many times we used to bring this person up at dinner and now we don't even mention them anymore. I mean, uh, setting realistic goals and measuring performance is critical. Otherwise, it seems like we're not making much progress. Think about it from the difficult person's point of view. Can you imagine what it's like to be the difficult person? They walk into the break room. Everyone quits talking. They hear you making plans to go to lunch. They're never invited. They hear you doing things with your coworkers over the weekends. They're not included. Kind of lonely being a difficult person. So to change your attitude towards the difficult people, I'd like you to quantify the lifetime value of a difficult person. Try to recognize something that they do in times of by 10. Maybe they volunteer an hour a week. Well, that's 50 hours a year. Over 10 years, that's 500 hours. That's a business order. That's three months of their time they give away. Or if they live in your school district and they pay property taxes, find out what their property taxes are. Times it by 10, $50,000, I guess I can put up with them going into the school system, going into the community for public services. But think of something that you can appreciate about that person. Uh, provide, well, I'll give you an example. I had an employee back in the 80s. I wanted to fire him. I was so sick of him. And I thought there must have been a good reason why I hired him. And he was a hard worker. And he was clever, a little too clever. That's why I wanted to fire him. So I was in my office. I was just working on the separation notice. And I thought, there's got to be a good something I can appreciate about it. It took over two hours. And I was just about ready to sign the separation notice. I sat back on my chair, and I took a look at the two shelves of bowling trophies we had over the years from the two bowling teams that I sponsored. And I said, well, he's a good bowler. It took me more than two hours to give him credit for that. Then once I kind of opened up the floodgates and I said he's a good bowler, I also remember, well, he's he's hardworking. He always shows up. And, And I did not fire him. I was back from my 25-year class reunion. I bumped into Willie at the Legion Club. He says, hey, Welchland, USOB. And he didn't use the letters. He used the words. 
I went up to Willie put my arm around him, ground my fist in his shoulders. How are you doing, Willie? He said, good, boss. How are you? I said, I'm doing fine. I said, what are you up to these days? He said, I'm still out of the shop. I said, you're still out of the shop. Yeah, that's great. I wanted to fire him back in 1986. Still there. Why? Because he's valuable. I just didn't like him. I still don't like him, but there's no reason to fire him. So sometimes we have to quantify the lifetime value of the difficult person. Then when you have people that have to work face-to-face or in the next cubicle or interact closely with difficult people, uh, provide them the authority to resolve their problems. You know, whatever you would provide for a suggestion, how to handle it, tell them that they can do the very same thing. Empower them to have a little bit more confidence in the conversation so they're not bullied by this person. So what is it that you say? How is it that you hold your ground? How is it that you make your demands? Make sure whoever has to deal with that difficult person has the same kind of list of strategies they can use. And number 35 is, uh, is this something a friend would charge for? Now, let's say that we worked together and a difficult person was coming down the hall and he said to me, hey, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 20 bucks. Smile, shake hands, give them a compliment and say, I look forward to seeing you again soon. I say, you're on. So they come down the hall and say, hey, hi, and I shake hands, I smile, I Say, uh, give them, pay them a comment. You've been working out. And then I say, hey, look forward to seeing you again soon. And I turn to you about 20 bucks. Why do we hold difficult people ransom, the common courtesies we give away to a friend? Double check how many times you say please and thank you to the people you like working with, how few times we say please and thank you to the people we don't like working with. And if there's any difference, there's some collusion going on. So be careful of that. Whenever there are problems with a difficult person, especially one that's ruthless, always apologize when you're wrong. You're always right when we apologize and fix the problem while the difficult person is still there. Whatever you can to remedy the situation. It's a small investment to get them out off the phone or get them out of the office so it doesn't cause any more damage. Explain how you do things and how it's their advantage to make sure we process this properly. Make sure this is completely accurate. Make sure that there isn't any mistakes that we will make. But you got to make sure you explain how you do things and how it benefits them. And measure performance. Uh, which one of these strategies seem to work? What's the reaction to it? And then make sure you put those into practice and really recognize how much better it has gotten, but measure your performance. Otherwise, it'll feel like not much has changed. Uh, differentiate yourself from others. I'd like you to watch other people in action that accidentally have these moments or episodes in which they're effective. Maybe they're standing up in the conversation when they have it. Maybe they have something printed out to hand to the person during the conversation. Or maybe they sit down, or maybe they go to their office, or maybe they have that person come to their office. But look for all of these incidental, accidental episodes of communication that other people you work with are somewhat effective with them. Take those little episodes, stick them to yourself like you're covered with Velcro, and you might have several hours of effectiveness just by observing others and kind of collecting all of those different accidental episodes in which people got along with this person quite well. Number 40 is understand your emotions so you can respond appropriately. All information simply comes through our senses. This raw data, no meaning has been applied to it. The second step is critical, which is our interpretation. Why would a person say this? Why would a person do this? Now, based upon that interpretation, we have a feeling, and once we're trapped in that emotional state, it limits our options in what we would say or what we would do when we feel like that, but we still need to, as a professional, express our best option. Now, the reason I want to talk about understanding your emotions and responding appropriately is because you don't get paid to take it personally. Now, you get paid to respond professionally. And you're thinking at 800 to 1,200 words per minute. So if you just slow down this interpretation process, what did they say? How did they say that? What could that mean? What did the person say that? How does that make me feel? And if you said curious, then you would ask a question like, what would you recommend? Or how would you solve this? Or what, 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 what are you considering or thinking? And then you express your best option. So you don't take it personally. It's not personal. They treat everybody this way. Next on that list, number 41, let me go back to number 41, is to give the reason first to save time. Now, that reason should be the language in your organization's mission statements and value statements. That should always be the reason for your request. Then they're not taking you on. They're taking on the principles of the organization. People sat around, took them coffee two years to write those emission statements. Those mission statements and value statements, use those for your reasons for requests. You know, to make sure we're at the cutting edge of technology, you know, to make sure we're providing shareholder return. Whatever the language in that mission statement, value statement, should always be the reason for your request. Laugh with them when you can. They used to say, share a laugh, share a sale, unless it violates your belief, attitudes, and values. Then you have to just act like you didn't get it. They think you're stupid anyway, so you have nothing to lose. Smile on the telephone. 
It's hard to take it personally when we're smiling. They might say, are you smiling? You say, no, this is nothing to smile about. But keep smiling. Have a mirror and smile. And it really does have those arrows uh, from them that would sting and hurt so badly. Uh, just seem to have no effect. Personalize your workspace. Please, not a picture of the family and friends, but of landscape or a, maybe a beach. Uh, because you can drag that negative emotion into the images of the people you love and care about. I work with a difficult person, they make me angry. I look at a picture of my wife. I work with that difficult person, they make me angry. I look at a picture of my wife. I can drag that negative emotion into that relationship. It's an inappropriate neurolinguistic association. My wife calls me, I think we call me at work. And then later on in my mind, honey, 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 I didn't mean that. So you want to make sure you personalize your workspace with cartoons or scenery or seascape, but not pictures of people you love and care about. Smile at everybody. What do normal people do when you smile at them? They smile back. What do difficult people think? Who cares? Smile at them anyway. Let them figure it out. Uh, when you're hanging up the phone from a ruthless, typical person, say, I look forward to talking to you, Bob Johnson. Say their name real loud. People will pop up out of their cubicles. You look forward to talking to Bob Johnson. Sure. Bob Johnson's wondering, what do they mean by that? Because no one's ever said that to Bob Johnson before. And I want you to keep this in mind. In one minute, I can change my attitude. In that minute, change my entire day. You have a handful of strategies that you think you're willing to try. Just remind yourself in a minute, the beginning of the day, and I'll tell you what, it will change your life because you'll respond rather than react. And if I was an actor, I'd get paid to play a role. Guess what? At work, I get paid to play a role, and so do you. You know all the characters. Just giving you all your lines, all your stage directions. Now all you need to do is play your part. Be a role model. Take some of these strategies. Put them into practice. Demonstrate and share with the people you work with of how to handle that difficult person you all know. And then understand paradigm shift. This difficult person could have been somebody that just wanted to get something done and that never got done, and people keep reminding them. Could have been somebody that wanted to get something done right and it was done wrong, and, you know, it still bothers them. Could have been somebody who wanted to get along with you and they felt left out. Could have been somebody who wanted to get appreciation, and we just bit our tongue. We could have contributed to it. I'm going to turn it over to Amanda for some questions. If you have some questions, I will answer those. Very good. Thank you, Kit. Um, oh, you're welcome. So I have gone ahead and opened up um, the floor for questions. So if you have any questions, please submit them to either the chat or the Q&A feature. I will also open up a poll at this time. Um, Kit, do you have any um, typical questions or comments you get um, about how to handle difficult people that, that you think would be real important out of all of those items you talked about for us to really take home today? Well, one of the things that often comes up is when people say, what about family? These are people that love and care about me. And they say some of the most hurtful things. Well, you know, when it comes to relationships, you know, there's a law called there's two elements content in the relationship. With difficult people, you really have to believe there is no relationship. So you're going to have to really take control of the conversation about what issues you're willing to talk about, what you're not going to talk about. If they want to talk about that, you will leave. You're just going to have to be that cut and dry with family, too, even if these are people that you love and care about. Because it's not reciprocal, and you deserve good relationships, and you don't need to be bullied and, and feel threatened and uncomfortable or have your self-esteem damaged, even if they're family. Yeah, that is true. Sometimes family um, can can get your blood pressure up quicker than anybody, um, probably oh, because they know they, you best. <laughs> yeah, they know your buttons. They don't just push them. They punch them. <laughs> Good. And I will also go ahead and put up um, Kit's contact information. Um, feel free to reach out to him directly or to myself if you have any questions or you'd like additional information. I know Kit does um, a lot of different speaking on lots of different topics. Um, so this is just one of many um, pieces of information that you can obtain from Kit. I well, thank you, Amanda. It's been a pleasure working with you. Oh, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, you know, we kind of flew through that to get that done in the hour time slot that we had, so I, I certainly appreciate you covering as much as you did for the team today. Um, so with that, I'll just kind of wrap it up to keep us on track. I'd like to thank all of our participants and Kit for sharing your knowledge of how to handle difficult people. The recording of this webinar will be available on our website at tricom.com. It's under the Resources and the Industry Insider Webinars tab. Thank you again for your participation and watch for information on our next webinar session. Thank you. Have a great day.